I'm so happy that some have come with their signal numbers on the their floor. Right? You, you actually ran? Little bit. I feel exercise coming on, I sit down firmly until it passes, but that's so bad. Those people who can do it. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another love filled Sunday at the Temple of Light, Center for Spiritual Living. You indeed raised me up personally, I'm so just so filled with love and joy to see your faces shining from the audience. And to feel the energy, that highest vibration of that highest octave of love from those who join us on the World Wide Web. Welcome, welcome, welcome. In 2016, BBC News carried this amazing story of a journey for love. According to the article, despite abject poverty and social stigmas of his untouchable past, Kadi Yuma Kumar Mahalandia earned a place as a student at the College of Arts in New Delhi. So he was studying. Oh, yes. Following his painting of Indira Gandhi, many people wanted him to draw them. And one of these was a tourist, Charlotte von Shedwin, who was traveling in India from Sweden. They soon fell in love. I gather that according to the article, the first time he drew her, she said, it doesn't look like me, I don't like it. I'll come back tomorrow. So I'm like, <laughs> So she went back the next day, and he didn't quite catch the lightning, so she went back the next day. Long story short, <laughs> big things in one. They okay. fell in love. And they got married. But Charlotte had to return home to Sweden. And she offered, of course, to pay Paddy Yuna's plane ticket, but he was he had too much pride to accept. And so he said, you go ahead of me, and I will save up the money, and I will be with you. I'll join you as soon as I can. But after a year, he still hadn't uh, got the plane fare. So he sold all of his possessions. He bought himself a bicycle, and then cycled for four months and three weeks covering 4,000 miles across Afghanistan, Iran, Turkey, Bulgaria, Yugoslavia, Germany and Austria, and Denmark to get to Sweden. There are, they, I gather, are still happily married and live in Sweden with their two children. Hanna Yuna has become a well-known artist and is a cultural ambassador. Here's why I shared this story with you. When he was asked about his arduous journey, his reply was this, I quote, I did what I had to do. I had no money, but I had to be with her. I was cycling for love, but never loved cycling. <laughs> it's simple, unquote. So I've tightened my encouragement this morning. Life is a work of art. And you know, friends, I really believe that our divine assignment is, and indeed the purpose of our very existence is to become truly loving, to just embody and embrace and exude the spirit of love. A Course in Miracles gives this advice, quote, when any situation arises which tempts you to become disturbed, say, and I quote, there's another way of looking at this. And when Jesus, in his wonderful Sermon on the Mount, said, turn the other cheek, that was what he was advising. To turn the other cheek meant to look at things from a different perspective, to look at it from the perspective of love. No, I can tell you a little personal um, story. It's a true story. My mother and father and I went to church one Sunday, many years before we came here, and the sermon was about the Sermon on the Mount. And then after church that day, they had one of those man and woman married couple arguments, and it was on the veranda at home. And my mother, in frustration, turned her, flashed her tail, and went inside. So I was fresh from studying human behavior at Johns Hopkins University, <laughs> and thought I knew it all, so I followed her into the kitchen and said, You know, Mom, um, we just came from a service which was about, about the love, and I think you, you know your behavior. She said, Behavior? The pastor said that he was turned the other cheek, and I did. <laughs> <laughs> My mom didn't get the fact, at the point, bless her heart, that the other way of looking at things is to see them through the eyes of love. 
Padayuna didn't love cycling, but he, he looked in, at the arduous journey from India to Sweden as cycling. Well, if I wonder how many of our chores we would do, we would feel about differently, you know, taking out the garbage, sweeping up the yard, washing the car, um, the, 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 the journey in the traffic to school in the mornings or back again, we pick up young ones in the afternoon. I wonder if, if we just admitted to ourselves we really don't like this but I'm doing it for love. I wonder if we could change the energy and the vibration that we feel about doing doing less and less on chores. And author Colette Burnham put it this way, love has the innate ability to look past the human and see the God. To look past the human and see the God in the heart and in the eyes of everyone that you come into contact. Ernest Hope is the great loving soul who gave the world this teaching, known as the Science of Mind. Writing on friendship in the Science of Mind textbook, page 299, says, and I quote, It is a law that the man who sees what he wants to see, regardless of what appears, will someday experience in the outer what he has so faithfully seen in the within. From selfish reasons alone, if there are no, if, if from no loftier reasons, we cannot afford to find fault, to hate, or even to hold in mind anything against any living soul. The God of love cannot hear the prayer of the one who fails to love. End of the God of love cannot hear the prayer of the one who fails to love. That's not coming from your place. And that's why no matter if you have anything against your brother or your sister, and you're coming with a gift, no matter how generous it is, leave it and go and make amends. Go and make peace. Go and find that love before you offer your gift. Everything in your life, my friends, making decisions, your lifestyle, your career, raising children, your friendships, your contribution to society, everything about your life will become more wholesome and coherent when you choose love, because life is a work of heart. Have you ever contemplated the shape of the human heart? Very interesting, it's a distinctive and fascinating shape, because it's not quite a circle and not quite a triangle. What a sort of blend of these two contours. If we view the heart using the metaphor of a triangle, its three-sided composition could be said to represent the structure at work in your friendships and your relationships. There's you on one side, your friend on the other, and the spirit of your friendship creating a third dimension which completes the triad. You on one side and the other person on the other and your friendship making that, that triangle, that triad. And you can therefore think of your friendships as a holy trinity. A trinity of originating, enduring, and completing love. Someone once said that our relationship with our friends and loved ones should be like the relationship between our two eyes. Do you know what the relationship between your two eyes um, is? They live together. They move together. They cry together. They see things together. They even sleep together but they never see each other. And that's what friendship is. Let's look at the heart then from the other, uh, in the other metaphor, the metaphor of the circle, that ancient symbol of unbroken continuity, belonging, and permanence. Viewed as a circle, the heart may be seen as a place of both arrival and departure, a place of endings, and yet a place of new beginnings. All the depleted blood arrives at your heart to be refreshed and revitalized, and it is from this center that the newly revivified life force sets out to nourish, heal, and restore your body temple. Author John O'Donoghue writes, and I quote, Because the heart dwells in unattended dark, we often forget its sublime sensitivity to everything that is happening to us. Your heart is really recording all of that, all that's happening around you. Without, he says, without our ever noticing, 
Our hearts absorb the joy of things and also their pain and care. Within us, therefore, a burdening can accrue. And for this reason, it is wise now and again to tune into your heart and listen to what it carries. End of that quote from John O'Donoghue. So just for a moment, just place your hand on your heart. And if it is comfortable for you, gently close your eyes. And feel the assurance that there beneath your hand, at the center of your body, that precious symbol of love holds your life within its short circle. And now with your eyes still closed, listen to what your heart is carrying today. If there are murmurs of sadness, pangs of regret, or any pain there, just silently say to your heart, God's love is in you now. God's love is in you now. And so with your eyes still closed, let me read you Ernest Hope's meditation on friendship from the Sands of Nine text. God in me is unified with God in all. This one is now drawing into my life all love and friendship. I am one with all people, with all things, with all life. As I listen in the silence, the voice of all humanity speaks to me and answers the love that I hold out to it. The great love which I now feel is now doing its perfect work. And it is felt by all and comes back to me from all. I understand all people and this understanding is reflected back to me from all. I give friendship and therefore I have friends. I help Therefore, I am helped. I uplift, therefore I am uplifted. I am now surrounded by all love, all friendship, all companionship, all health, all happiness, all success. I am one with life. So I wait in the silence while the great spirit bears this message to the whole world. And so just take a deep breath and very slowly open your eyes. One of the best things you can do to be healthy, wealthy, and happy and self-actualized as a person is to love yourself unconditionally. Loving and honoring your own inner self and treating yourself with respect and dignity is the easiest pathway to us and the joy of being my friends. And so this brings me to your side. Your mission this week, should you decide to undertake it, is to consciously love yourself. Decide what you can do to love yourself more completely and just, just to embrace yourself. Maybe you want to place a note on your refrigerator or bathroom mirror to remind you to love yourself. My favorite affirmation, it comes from Louise Hay, and it is simply, I love and approve of myself. You say to me, come out the shower before you put on any clothes, it's very healing. <laughs> My favorite always reminds me that yes, I love me once and all, and that I am lovable, loving, and worthy of love. 
And I want you to do one more thing. Treat yourself more generously this coming week. And I'm not saying buy yourself a Valentine's Day because that's become so commercial. But treat yourself to a I love you gift. It doesn't have to be extravagant. Buy yourself one beautiful flower, or maybe a new lipstick, ladies. Or treat yourself to an inspirational book from our book room. And here's one for the men. Buy yourself a small, good quality body lotion and use it this week on your elbows. And you know the men will take care of your eyes. For those of us that have significant others, they do it for us and God bless them. And each of us say, look here, I thank you. But those of us that are single, we really need to take better care of our elbows and our feet. <laughs> Am I right or am I right? I believe it was the psychologist and psychoanalyst Eric Fromm who said that I quote, our highest calling in life is precisely to take loving care of ourselves. Unquote. And it is now proven that when you change your attitude about yourself from the negatives you have internalized over the years and you take a more positive self-concept, everything else in your life will change for the better. One of the secrets, you know, that really turned me on to the science of mind was the truth that we live our lives from the inside out. And that all of that is really a reflection of what you are thinking habitually and what you have been believing for a long time, what your consciousness is all about. And I never forget my beloved spiritual mother, Reverend Dr. Elma, standing at this podium and saying uh, that if you look in the mirror and you hear it all over, don't form the mirror. <laughs> I loved her for it. I screamed love her. I said, and I was, I, I was bored at the time. I said, but I'm not forming nothing. I'm working on myself. So friends, if you take nothing else away from today's encouragement, please remember that you are affected only by what happens inside you. Your own feelings, your own thoughts, and your own choices to love or not to love. And that includes loving yourself. In fact, most important is loving yourself. And you know, so many people constantly denigrate themselves and belittle themselves all the time. And that's what creates the problem. And they come to me for counseling and I'm saying well, it's a delusion to think that anybody or anything can make you happy or make you feel bad. It's a choice you make in your own life. It's a, it's a hard problem to solve, but when you get that, you can take responsibility for your, your own happiness and your own joy and your own bad feelings to when you have them. It's okay to have them and to acknowledge that you're vexed, but you don't live in that place, you reach for the love, which is at a high vibration to move you out of it. And so friends, I'd like to end as I began with a story from India, which I found most instructive. It's about a woman who married a rich widower and found herself in the lap of luxury. The couple loved each other very much indeed, but there was a stain on the woman's happiness, and it was this. Her husband's son made no secret of his dislike of and resentment towards her. She did everything possible to ingratiate herself with him, but to no avail. Try as she might, she could not crack the cold barrier the boy had placed between them. And finally, in desperation, she seeks out a holy man who lives in a cave way up in the mountains. And after an arduous climb and many hours of waiting, she obtains audience with the holy man and explains her predicament. My steps are hates me, she wails. I would do anything in the world to win his love. The holy one says, well, there is one way. Tell me, tell me, she, she begs. I'll pay handsomely for the secret. You know, we always think we can buy it or we into an out of anything. He smiles and says that there is no charge, but there is a task to be accomplished. She must seek out a dangerous man-eating tiger that lives in a cave several days' journey from her town where she lives. She must, unaided and without harming the animal, bring the holy man a hair plucked from the tiger's tail. The woman thanked him and hurried back home to tell her husband that she must go on this holy quest in order to heal the relationship with her stepson. As you may imagine, the husband is 
try to dissuade her. That's very good. That's dangerous. Don't do that. We love each other. That's all that matters. But no, she's obsessed with winning her stepson. Love. So she goes on her holy mission. And after several days' journey, she finds the tiger's tail. But how did she get to pluck her hair from the tiger's tail without being devoured? Finally, she hits upon a plant. She places a, meat, a, a plate of meat as near as she can go without getting devoured herself to the entrance to the cave, and then she secretes herself and she watches. And as night falls, the tiger comes out. He sniffs the plate of meat suspiciously, and then he devours it. She repeats that the next night, and the next night, and the next night, for six nights, until the tiger has become habituated to getting this plate of meat. And on the seventh night, she puts a sediment in me, it is in me. And of course, the tiger devours it without being covered in the snake oil and falls as she expected into a deep, deep sleep. So she plucks the, the treasured hair from the tiger's tail and makes her way back home and then up the mountain another arduous time to the cave of the holy man and she presents him with her treasure. And he smiles. Well done. She says, now will I earn my, my stepson's love? Will he love me now unconditionally as I love him? And he says, well, only if you put as much effort into loving yourself as you have placed in gaining the love of your stepson. You need to love yourself first. And when you do, then the spirit of love within you will tell you when to speak when to be silent, when to reach out and when to let him be, what to do and what not to do in order to begin to create a relationship of respect and of love. And so I want to just leave that story because sometimes we, we spend so much time in Jamaica we say yamming up ourselves, you know, just killing up ourselves to attain other people's admiration and affection when really we are neglecting ourselves and we forget that our work is really a work of heart. We need to start here, where, where God is enshrined in perpetual splendor, and to allow that love that we are to touch, to heal, to bless, and to transform the lives of everyone with whom we come into contact. And so you don't need to block the state with the hair from the title state. Just be loved. And you don't need to turn the other cheek, as my mom did. It means look at it from another perspective. See things from the perspective of love and allow your life to be a work of art. Just turn to your neighbor and say, The love in me beholds the love in you. Our life is a work of art. Namaste. My friends, the love in me beholds the love in you. Our lives are a work of